can be hard at different times in life to hear clearly from God. And I'm sure you've been there. If you know the Lord, uh, you've known seasons where it was really easy to know, I know exactly what God wants me to do. And other times, it's difficult. It's difficult to know exactly what God wants me to do, or even if I should be waiting to hear from God, or if God's already said what He wants me to do and I need to go ahead and go. Um, you know, God, am I waiting? Am I going? There's a, a very famous passage in uh, the book of Joshua where uh, Joshua is supposed to go and attack the, the, uh, the city of Jericho, right? And, uh, and he gets on his face and he prays and the angel of the Lord appears to Joshua and he says, what are you doing on your face praying? Get up and go. And it's like, well, so, you, so you don't want me to pray? Uh, yeah, uh, it's confusing sometimes. We're just human beings. Well, I'm only a human being. Uh, maybe you got some special juice uh, imparted to you that makes you superhuman. For me, I'm just Jonathan. And so there are times when I'm wanting and waiting to hear from the Lord, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting, and, and I, should I be waiting? Here we are in the middle of a series where I am waiting to hear from the Lord. I am waiting to hear from, from the Lord, and I hope that you are waiting to hear from the Lord, uh, because we as a church need to hear from the Lord. And, and so maybe, maybe you, you feel like God has already spoken to you, and you're ready to go. You're ready to, uh, to move. As a church family, you're saying to yourself, hey, I've read through this booklet, or I've been at a part of a discussion forum. I'm good to go. Let's go. Or maybe you showed up yesterday uh, to the fall festival and you saw all those families and kids come through and you're like, wow, if this is what God is inviting us into, then this is what I want to be a part of. Um, but maybe you're sitting and you're thinking, I have questions about the planting season vision. I have questions about uh, planting season vision key number one, which I spoke on last Sunday. If you weren't here last Sunday, you should go and check out the message where I unpack that planting key Number one involves each of us individually, individually making a, an affirmation. I want Christ to be formed in me. Rory's baptism earlier today was a demonstration of his faith, his willingness to say, I'm going to do something that God has called me to do, and I'm going to do it in front of everybody where everybody can kind of see so that everybody will know I'm with Jesus. That's what baptism is. It's that public affirmation of what God has done privately in our hearts. Well, what I want to do today, and this was sort of what I promised last week, because you, uh, you filled out, many of you filled out a survey at the, at the end of last week's message, where you had an opportunity to share some feedback and also to ask some questions. And so I'm going to address those questions during our, during our time this morning. And uh, thank you. Uh, lovely assistant, Allison, who's my wife, just, you know, you know yeah, yeah. anyway, uh, but we're also going to unpack another text of Scripture, unpack another very brief text of Scripture, which is another way of looking at planting key number one. Last week was that Christ be formed, and this is a vision statement. Paul made a vision statement to the Galatian churches when he said, I am in the pains of labor again that Christ be formed in you. He's saying, I'm working right now in the hope and in the prayer that something's going to happen in the future and that the something is that Christ be formed in you. This is a vision statement. Today's text uh, is also a vision statement, and this one is made by the Lord Jesus, recorded for us a total of seven times in the book of Revelation. Jesus says this statement seven times in the book of Revelation. And you know seven is an important number to God, right? It's an important number in Scripture, and it's an important number in the book of Revelation. Somebody, somebody tell me, what does seven sometimes signify in Scripture? Perfection. Yes, uh, you raised your hand. What were you going to say, John Robert? Okay, you got it right then too, good. Yes, uh, so yeah, so perfection, completion, no longer anything remaining undone. Rem remember Jesus, uh, sorry, God created the world in six days and on the seventh he rested, signifying done. 
I'm done creating. No more creation needs to be done. Um, and so here we are in the book of Revelation, and I'm going to take just one, just one of the seven times, but it's the, same, it's the same thing all seven times. All seven times he says it, it's the same thing. You can turn in your Bible, if you like, to Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, if you want to see this short little verse, little snippet. Or you can look in, uh, if your Bible's like mine, it's got little uh, sections here in chapters 2 and chapter 3, uh, where there are seven letters written uh, by the John the Apostle, dictated to him by Jesus himself. So if you've got one of those red letter Bibles, uh, there's red all over the page here in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Jesus himself dictating a letter to seven different churches, and in order for us to hear clearly today, I'm going to invite you, if you would, to please join me in prayer. <clears throat> God, I, I know everybody in here has physical ears. This would be a pretty, pretty misguided, ill-fated effort on my part if the folks here couldn't physically hear. But my prayer is that, Lord Jesus, you would grant us ears of faith to hear your Spirit speaking to us, each of us and all of us, able, willing to hear you speak. Bless your word and bless the application of your word in our living. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there it is. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever has ears. You got ears? Yeah, you, you do. Yeah. You just, even in case you're not sure, you just check real quick. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. But you understand, the, the Spirit doesn't usually speak where you can pick it up on a recording device, right? So there's two kinds of hearing. There's the kind of hearing that you're doing to me when you're listening and you're saying, okay, I understand the words that he's saying, and you know, I can pretty much get what he's trying to communicate. <clears throat> and then there's the kind of listening that is done at another level. Let's call it spiritual listening. And I'll just say, hey, we as Baptists sometimes get a little anxious when somebody starts talking about spiritual listening. We're kind of known for it. We're kind of known for it. Uh, and so sometimes, sometimes as Baptists, when, when the preacher says, hey, listen to the Spirit, people go, now what are you trying to say, preacher? Well, what I'm hoping that you will hear is not just the words that I am saying, but that you will hear the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of the living God, the one who was there at creation, the scriptures say, fluttering over the waters when God said, let there be, and creation went boom. That you will hear that same divine person speaking in your heart. You say, I don't understand. What does that even look like? You know what? He's God. I'm not. I can tell you the scripture does warn that occasionally other spirits speak. That's why John says, test the spirits to see if they be from God. There's only one Holy Spirit and a lot of pretenders. I am not God. I speak for him, but he's God. He can speak for himself. And so what Jesus is saying is if you've got ears, listen. Listen. You're not going to hear it, which is to say the word God is speaking in the room, though he has done that from time to time. Sometimes in my life when I said, God, would you just write it in the sky for me? <laughs> you know, like if I just saw it in a cloud or if I, uh, you know, if I, if I, if I saw, saw a burning bush, 
whoo, that would be easy. See a burning bush, remember Moses, right? He's like, oh, I think something's going on over here. And then God speaks, Moses, take your shoes off. Okay, yeah, yeah. Seven times, though, Jesus says, listen to the Spirit. If he says it seven times, and seven means perfection, I think he really wants us to get this one. It's really important. He wants us to hear what he's saying. In fact, this is not the first and only time that Jesus has said, anybody that has ears, let them hear. He said the same thing in his earthly ministry. You know that in the book of Revelation, Jesus has ascended to the highest heavens, right? But when he was walking around, this is before his crucifixion, before his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, he's walking around, and everybody thinks he's just a regular guy. Just a regular guy. But he's talking and he's teaching and he says this, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And we understand when he's talking in his regular earthly ministry what he means because some of the people are hearing what he says and want him dead. And others are hearing and going, huh, I don't understand. What do you mean the kingdom of heaven is like a seed that a man planted and went away? What do you mean that uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower who went out to sow seed? And what do you mean, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth? What do you mean? I don't get it. And Jesus is saying, okay, listen with your heart because God will give you the truth of the matter. And this applies to us here because what we're asking is, God, God, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do as a church? But more to the point, each of you is asking, God, what do you have for me? Or you're not. But Jesus is saying, I want you to listen. I want you to listen. It's important to me that you listen. Now, here's here's how this kind of draws from an Old Testament theme. So in the New Testament, Jesus shows up and says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And in the book of Revelation, he says it seven times to seven different churches, and we're supposed to listen to the Word of God. And in the Word of God, is telling us to listen to the Holy Spirit. And so we've got Word and Spirit, and remember Spirit and in truth. And Jesus says, true worshipers will worship me in Spirit and in truth. So the Spirit is always going to speak in accordance with what the Word of God says. But he's going to help us to apply what the Word of God says to our lives And so how do we do that? Well, you might be interested to know that sometimes God doesn't want us to understand. What? What? When has that ever happened, you say? Check this out. God speaks to the prophet Isaiah 600 years before Jesus walked on the earth and said, you're going to be a prophet, and I'm going to send you out, and I'm going to tell you to tell the people my word. But here's what's going to happen. I'm going to make it so they don't understand. And you say, why in the world would God do that? You'll see. You'll see. So hang on. God says to Isaiah, or rather in Isaiah's presence, make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Well, God... (laughs) If you want to heal them, don't make it so they can't hear you. How, how are you going to heal them if they can't hear you? And he says, ah, I have a plan. I have a plan. I'm going to make it so they can hear me, but something has to happen first. Before anybody is going to ever hear me clearly, and he's talking here about the people of Israel. This is biblical Israel. And as you know, that um, the secular nation Israel today is... Um, full of Jewish people who do not, for the most part, believe that Jesus is their Messiah. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 9 and 10 and 11 that God has hardened the hearts of Israel so that they will not turn and believe. And there is a promise at the end of Romans chapter 11 that all Israel will be saved by coming to faith in Jesus Christ, but that hadn't happened yet. So there's still, to this day, a hardening on Israel's hearts that God has left in place. But, but, the second part of this shows up in Isaiah's ministry in chapter 32 when God says, see, 
a king will reign in righteousness. And rulers, these are, these are folks that are going to submit to the king, rulers will rule with justice. A king will reign. Who do you suppose God's talking about? Who do you suppose God's talking about? Which king do you suppose he's talking about here? King Jesus. We just sang about him. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Lion and the lamb, incidentally, comes from the book of Revelation, right? It's this picture of the king who is the lion, who was the lamb, who was slain. And when that king reigns in righteousness, this is what happens. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed. Oh. And the ears of those who hear will listen. The fearful heart will know and understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. So God said to Isaiah, make this people so they can understand me. But then the king, when the king gets here, those who see the king, who love the king, who worship the king, they're going to be able to see. They're going to be able to hear. They're going to be able to know and understand. But you understand, first of all, they've got to say, like Rory said earlier, yeah, Jesus is Lord. Because if you can't, you can't get that one, you're not going to hear anything else. If Jesus is Lord, if Jesus is your king, then listen up. The Spirit is speaking to you, telling you what your king wants you to hear. And you say, what's he saying? Oh, I'm not him. <laughs> I'm not him. I mean, I'm telling, you, I'm telling you what he has for all of us here today. And for each of us, he has something for us. I mean, I've, I've preached sermons where I've said, and here's the main point. And I get to the end of the sermon. And somebody comes up to me and says, you know what? Uh, here's what I heard you say. And they tell me something. I'm like, yeah, that wasn't me. I mean, that was great. What you just said was beautiful. I mean, that was amazing. I didn't say that. I was talking, talking, talking. You heard Jesus. <laughs> That's who you heard talking to you. I've heard people come up and say, well, here's what I think you were trying to say. And I'm like, I don't think that was Jesus. Uh, that definitely wasn't me either. I remember I went to a, uh, my wife and I, we went, we went to a, like an, a passion play one time at a very charismatic church. This was 10 years ago. We were living in New York. Very charismatic church. And sometimes this goes a little far, right? So folks take this a little far and they say, oh, the Spirit's telling me uh, some kind of kooky something. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't, I don't think that's Jesus. I don't think that's the Holy Spirit telling you that. But, but sometimes this gets taken a little too far. And the lady that was sitting next to me uh, leans over and she says, you know, God told me I have the power to cure cancer. And I wanted to say, what are you doing here? Get to the hospital, lady. There's people with cancer. And I didn't say, I said, oh, okay, well, wonderful. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it's nice to meet you. I'm Jonathan. I don't know. I mean, what do you say to a person that's like, you know, sitting on the plane next to somebody and somebody's not, you tell yourself, we're going to be together for a little while here. I don't know what to say. So I'm going to read my book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes folks come out with kooky talk and you might be a little nervous. Well, if I, I've heard this too. If I open myself up to hearing from the Spirit, how will I know that what I'm hearing is from God? To which I reply, do you think God is so sloppy and so, let's say, kooky that he's not going to give you the guidance you need through other people, through his word, through his spirit confirming his word to you? Do you think that God is going to just drop something, let's drop a rock in your spiritual pond, and they'd be like, hey, let's see how they figure this one out. <laughs> No, no, he's not. I mean, we, God's ways are not our ways. God is mysterious. But let's say it this way. He gives us what we need. He gives us what we need. And if you as a believer are nervous that, well, some other spirit might speak, and so, no, no, I'm going to just close my eyes and cover my ears, and no, 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 no. That's giving the devil more credit and more power than he really has. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 
And so if you're ever confused, the Scripture says, test the spirits to see if they be from God. Come and talk to somebody, a pastor, a trusted mentor, and say, "Ah, I want to hear what God is saying, but I'm confused. Is this what God is saying to me? This vision, key number one, is about you being willing to respond to God's call on you. And you say, well, what's God saying to me? We're going to get to that here in a second. But planting key number one, it's in the book, and I showed you last week, is to let the Spirit speak. Let Him speak. Hear what the Spirit, you got ears? Hear what the Spirit is saying to you. It says, whoever has ears, the Greek actually says, let the one who has ears, let that one person hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So there in your heart, with your spiritual ears, saying, yes, God, I want to hear from you. And if I hear from you, I'm going to trust that you're not going to just leave me, me. You're going to send me to the people in my life. So I'm willing to speak for you. You've spoken to me. I'm willing to speak for you. To the people who are near. And this is what I say. Who are the people in your backyard? Who are the people that are in your life? Who are the people that you regularly associate with, regularly connect with? And if they're all Christians, find some new ones. Not to say that you're getting rid of your Christian friends, but to say, hey, are you willing to let God send you to some folks who don't listen to Jesus? And if so, and you're doing that near, well, guess what? It's not going to be very long before he sends you over there. And if you're looking at that map and going, well, those are dangerous places. I don't know where God's going to send you. The point is, he's the one. And if you're willing, you say, God, I'm willing. Because planting key number one, this is just number one. We're going to get to planting key number two next Sunday for two weeks. Planting key number three in uh, three weeks. Planty key number one is your invitation to allow God to shape you into Christ's image for his purposes. And if you're there, you're there. But some of you have questions. So I thought I'd share with you all the questions that you asked last week. You ready? These are all the questions. Now, I've rewritten them because some of them were long and some of them were short. And so, uh, but I've written them and I've written them all out. Here, uh, I've, I've grouped them into two groups. So the first group I'm going to give you is miscellaneous, and the second group of questions, it all kind of just, they all fit together into one lump. So here we go. Here's the first question. How will we decide on the vision if we're not voting? Early on in the process, uh, in talking with the elders and talking uh, with staff, I said, I think we have to vote. I mean, isn't that kind of a Baptist thing? Don't we have to vote in order for all of us to know this is what we're going to do? This is how we're going to... And what we discovered in the discussion forums that the leadership team, members of the leadership team, were hosting was some of the folks said, we don't understand why we're voting if this is a spiritual commitment. And so that was the feedback. And I was like, you know, that's a good point. I mean, we tend to vote on stuff that's like, you know, uh, big picture. We tend to vote on stuff like that. But we are going to vote on a budget. We are going to vote on a slate of uh, nominees. We do vote when it comes to appointing new officers to the church. But is this really a voting kind of a thing, this vision? Or is this really more of an affirmation kind of a thing, like a personal commitment? And if it's a personal commitment, do we say, well, 80% of the people are personally committed and 20% are not. I mean, that just felt weird. It started to feel weird. And the leadership team said, here's what we would like to do. We would like to recommend, and this is why, you know, they've got paid the big bucks. The leadership team said, we would like to recommend that you do an affirmation Sunday. And so I changed the plan. I said, all right, we won't vote. We'll vote on a budget afterward because we have to vote on a budget. But we'll affirm... Vision key number one, two, and three, or we won't, because it'll be up to all of us and each of us, right? But instead of voting, we're going to affirm. And, you, and, if, and those of you that were raised in Baptist churches, like I was raised in a Baptist church, you're like, well, you got to vote. You got to vote. And I'm like, okay, okay. But listen, <laughs> not everybody feels like this is like legislation. It's not. We're not changing our bylaws, our constitution. We're simply saying, here's what we see God calling us to do, or not. It's an invitation. So the second question that comes in this miscellaneous is, why don't we sing more hymns in worship? Which is a great question. I get that question pops up every now and again. 
uh, why don't we sing more hymns, which I don't know that the vision directly addresses this, but, um, but this is a question that gets asked from time to time. And my answer is, has been the same since before I came to uh, Morningside to be your pastor, which is Morningside's worship for me is glorious, is beautiful. And we have a team of worship planners. It's uh, Chris Trammell, uh, Allison, and Zach Hamsley. And every week they meet and they pray and they take the scripture that I've given them and they plan a worship service. And my instruction to them is, I would like for you to make sure there's at least one hymn or during Christmas season, at least one Christmas carol in every worship service that we host. We've been doing that for, well, four and a half years since I've been here. So I haven't changed anything. I haven't changed what I, what I, what I inherited, and we haven't changed anything since we've gotten here. Uh, last week we sang two hymns. Uh, what did you guys do? You sang two hymns last week. Last week they sang, take my life and let, let it be consecrated. And they sang, in Christ alone. And you say, well, in Christ alone wasn't one of those hymns I grew up with. Well, right. It's a modern hymn. But this is the point, right? That some modern hymns and some modern worship songs. and so. Uh, but if ever you say, I'd like a hymn, uh, a particular hymn or a particular song, you know who the people are who plan the worship. I plan the sermon, they plan the worship. You could talk to Chris, you could talk to Allison, you could talk to Zach. Share your, share your thoughts, share your desires with them. Nobody's, nobody's sitting over there going, ha, 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 we have control now. No, um, we want to hear from you. And thank you for those questions. All right, so those are the two, I'm going to call those miscellaneous questions. Now, I'm going to go through these next ones pretty quick. The first question, and these have been rewritten, but I'm, I'm just sort of kind of trying to couch them briefly. What opportunities will I have to fulfill vision key number one? What new resources will we have to grow in Christ? What specifics are in the plan to see Christ formed in all of us? What can I be doing practically right now? How can I be praying? These are questions you ask. What is the plan for new groups in, in the next year and the spring relationship Series. These were things mentioned and opportunities at the end of the, um, this little booklet. And then how can we be helping each other grow in Christ? And now you can see why I put all of these together. Because all of these have to do with specifics. What can we do now? What will we be doing later? What's the plan? And I'm like, great question. All of these questions, great. And they all fall under this category of, so what do we do? I mean, what do you want us to do? What do we do? And I love it <laughs> because it sort of suggests like, yeah, well, huh, we're ready to get to it. And I want to say yesterday was a part of the plan. Yesterday, we open up the parking lot and we park a bunch of cars and fill the cars with candy. It wasn't enough, by the way. We ran out of candy. And we say, y'all come to all our neighbors on Facebook and other, and, and, but we can't do it if some of you don't help. That's one way. You say yes when somebody says, can you help? You're like, well, I'm doing that already. You're already on mission. Well, all right, all right, but, but how's Christ going to be formed in me? The scriptures are pretty clear that when you serve the Lord in love, by serving others humbly in love, Christ is formed in you. Sometimes folks have gotten in the habit of saying, that's somebody else's job. I don't know who. I, I, it's not my job. I'm not the Holy Spirit. But for folks that are saying, well, the church needs to, or the church should, or uh, shouldn't the church be, you are the church. <laughs> you are. So at some point, if, some, if a parent comes up to me and says, I have a passion that the church should be doing this in kids' ministry, I'm going to say, you're hired. Because if you've already got a passion, you're the best person for the job. Go talk to Barbara, Barbara Port. If somebody comes forward and says, I have a passion for worship and music, go talk to Chris. I have a passion, I have a desire, I have a hope, I have a whatever. Okay, I suspect you're listening to the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You just assumed he was talking to somebody else. 
that it was somebody else's job. He was just letting you in on the fact, hey, you need, you need to tell somebody that somebody's job is to do something I'm telling you to do. All I'm saying is, what opportunities will I have to fulfill vision key number one? You have an opportunity right here and right now to say, Spirit, speak to me. And the next time something comes up on our calendar, and the next time we're saying, hey, we're going to move into our neighborhood and do this or that. Or the next time we start a new class, and Al, I think one of Alice's classes was posted up here, and Alice is leading a new class. Uh, you say, I'm a woman, and they're doing a woman's Bible study. I'm signing up. Or the next time your Bible fellowship class says, hey, we're collecting an offering for uh, this group of people over here or for this need over here. You go, okay, I'm in. But the point is that at each opportunity you recognize, hey, this is not just something that the church is doing. This is an opportunity. I've listed a few at the back of the booklet that are new. But not everything needs to be new. And you say, well, what's changing? What's the big deal? We're changing. God is changing us. He's growing us, shaping us, shaping me. And if every time you say a sentence that says, well, how can the church just change it to how can I? And you're there. You're there. How can I be praying? Spirit, speak to me. What new resources will we have to grow in Christ? Well, I'm leading a class right now with key leaders called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And some folks said, it's got emotion in the title. I'm out. Okay, all right, I get it. It does sound new and different, but there are 40 or so folks that are going through the class right now based on Scripture, and we see some folks um, uh, enjoying their time together, learning some new ways of meeting God and working together. We're going to open this up in the spring. So Emotionally Healthy Spirituality be open in the spring. I, I help teach and facilitate it. I'm taking some men through a new group. We call it the Round Table. Just a few men, but we're going to open it up to all the men come spring. And so if you're a man... If you've got an XY chromosome, you're going to be invited to be a part of the men's round table, cell groups where we meet in homes or restaurants or whatever it might be, and, and just two or three guys connecting. And if you say, well, I'm not interested, okay, but this is the point. You pick and choose. When the opportunities come up, you say, hey, this is something God is telling me I should be doing. What can I be doing practically right now? What are the specifics? What is the plan? Uh, how can we be helping each other? Um, generally speaking, There's something on the calendar. Generally speaking, whatever's coming up next is your opportunity to let Christ be formed in you. If I said to you, here are the seven things that all of you need to do for Christ to be formed in you, then you should say to me, many are the plans of Jonathan's heart. <laughs> and you're trying to tell us there's one fix for all of us or one solution, or one plan for all of us. But Pastor Jonathan, it's the Lord's purpose that prevails, not your human plans, to which I would say, you know what, you're right. That's what the Scripture says. Many are the plans of a man's heart. So I don't want to say, here is the plan for every Christian that's a part of Morningside. What I want to say is, here's the Lord's purpose, and here's how you discover His purpose for you. That's what I want to say. And so there it is again. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And here's what you maybe didn't realize. Not every Christian is a cookie-cutter copy of every other Christian. Maybe you did know that. But I will tell you this. We're all of us ordinary in the sense that we need the same Savior, we need the same Lord. And so what I'd like to do is just very briefly tell you about seven people, seven kinds of ordinary. Um, this first lady, her name is Evelyn. She's from Ephesus. Now, you're going to figure this out pretty quickly, but uh, this is a lady who was going to church at the church in Ephesus, and Jesus wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus, and Evelyn is hearing Jesus's letter read to her. And what can we conclude about uh, Evelyn? Well, she has a discerning mind. You can read the letter. It's the first eight verses of uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Evelyn has a discerning mind, and she's careful to spot theological error. But she's forgotten about love. 
And it's because she has this misguided quest. She always needs to be right. She's not showing compassion like she used to. And what does Jesus say to her? Let Evelyn hear what the Spirit is saying to Evelyn. And if you wanted to summarize what Jesus says to Evelyn at Ephesus, he's saying, love louder. Specifically, remember your first love. Repent. He says this to Evelyn at Ephesus. Well, then there's Samuel at Smyrna. Samuel at Smyrna, he's poor. And if you looked at him, you would think he doesn't have all that much going for him. Poor and needy on the outside. But spiritually, Jesus says, you are rich, Samuel. And you've been suffering constant false accusations from folks who claim to speak for God. You can read the letter. The letter to the church at Samuel, church of Samuel at Smyrna. <laughs> but guess what? These folks that claim to speak for God are actually listening to the other guy, to the other team. But don't worry. Here's what I say to you, Samuel. Hold on. Hold on. Well, then there's Patrick at Pergamum. Patrick at Pergamum. He's struggling under temptation. And what he's struggling with is Patrick uh, continues to join in with the secular culture around him. Patrick is he's not confused. He knows what's right and wrong. But he just kind of goes out and he does what everybody else does, all the unbelievers. He hasn't denied the faith. But he's living like an unbeliever, and here's why. He's afraid of other people's judgment. He's afraid other people will judge him and be like, oh, you're one of those holy rollers. So he just joins in to get along. And here's what Jesus says to Patrick at Pergamum. Clean it up. Specifically, repent. Then there's Thelma Lou at Thyatira. Thelma Lou. By the way, I tried to choose names of people I don't know. Thelma Lou, I don't know anybody named Thelma, Thelma Lou. You may know somebody named Thelma, Thelma Lou. I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about Thelma Lou at Thyatira. And here's Thelma Lou at Thyatira. She's a strong believer in many ways. But she has a close friend named Jesse Bell. Come on now. That was a good one. Jesse Bell. Jezebel. Yeah, this is the joke, folks. All right, come on. She has a close friend named Jesse Bell. And Jesse Bell is a really negative influence on Thelma Lou. And if Jesse, sorry, if J Jesse Lou's going to get, or sorry, Jesse Bell is going to get judged. Jesus says, I'm coming for her, and it's not going to be pretty. Thelma Lou, you better clear out. Sorry, I'm talking a little bit like I'm from around here. <laughs> yes, okay, so Thelma Lou had better watch out. That's what Jesus says to Thyatira. Thelma Lou and Thyatira, watch out. Stanley, it's Sardis. He's a good man. But he's living in the glory days when his faith was vibrant and strong and now his reputation does not match up with his current relationship with Jesus. He's grown spiritually lazy. And what does Jesus say to Stanley at Sardis? Wake up! It's not going to go well for you if you don't wake up. Then there's Fiona at Philadelphia. Fiona at Philadelphia is a little bit like uh, Samuel at Smyrna in that Jesus doesn't have anything negative to say about Fiona at Philadelphia. Because you see, even though Fiona is ordinary in her own eyes, she's extraordinary in Jesus' eyes. She stands out to Jesus. Even though for the rest of us, we don't, we don't know anything much about Fiona because she's just a regular, ordinary Christian. But for Jesus, her faith is real, unlike many of the others around her. And she shines brightly for God. That's Fiona at Philadelphia. And Jesus says to Fiona, keep it up. Keep it up. And then lastly, Loretta at Laodicea. Loretta at Laodicea. Rich. Proud. Spiritually blind. Looks down her nose and apathetic. She could care less because she's got everything she needs. But God still loves Loretta. And therefore, he is giving her an opportunity to let Jesus back in as he stands at the door and knocks. But time is short. And what does Jesus say to Loretta? Honey, I'm home. Let me in. 
I'm here. Let me in. These are seven ordinary Christians. They're all different. All at different places in their faith, all at different places in their walk. And what Jesus says to all seven of these Christians, if you've got ears, hear what the Spirit is saying. And here's the rest of it, the rest of the verse. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And how is it that one is victorious? You listen and obey. Listen and and change. Listen, follow, listen, and live. You may not know Kathy Belt. That's an actual person, by the way. Kathy Belt is not the same. She's not related in any way, as far as I know, to Jesse Bell. <laughs> Kathy Belt, pictured on the screen, is the same Kathy Belt sitting about four rows from the back right over there. And Kathy Belt agreed to let me throw her picture on the screen, even though she shook her head and closed her eyes and went, oh, okay, pastor. I'm like, all your body language is saying no, but I'm gonna listen to your words. So what happened? What happened with Kathy Bell? Well, for one of the things, Kathy Bell recently told me, I am not the kind of Christian who goes up to strangers and talks to them. I'm very, very quiet. And, and if you've known Kathy for any length of time, you know that that is true, that she is a very quiet, reserved, very dignified, very lovely woman. But she's, you know, fairly reserved. But recently, a new person came into the church by the name of Pamela Thorning. And Kathy Bell just did, did what she'd never done before. She walked right up to Pamela and said, hey, I'm Kathy. And could I introduce you to some new folks in the church? And I think Kathy was a little bit stunned by, by this. But, but, but God wasn't done. You see, at our Reach and Go discussion forum, which was just about three or four weeks ago, Kathy Belt came along with 50 or 60 other individuals to hear about our plan for outreach and our plan for missions. And one of the things that I said was, hey, if there's anybody in here that'd be willing, we have this new ministry that we're calling our Adopt a Neighbor uh, Initiative. And there's an app that we're gonna be using to help guide our actions to reach neighbors, the people at their point of greatest need, so that we can make sure that we're connecting with the people in our community. And so we need, I'd, I'd love it if you guys would pray and ask the Lord, and maybe there's somebody here that the Lord would, would prompt, but we'll see. I said, if not, I may come knocking. And so now fast forward to this past week. Kathy called Julianne, our Connecting Ministry Director, and Julianne reported to me that Kathy Belt said, God will not leave me alone on this. God just won't leave me alone. I can't get it out of my head. He's been tapping me on the shoulder, telling me, I want you to do that, I want you to do that, and here I am going, what do you mean, me? She said, but I'm calling you, would you pray for me? And Julianne says, yeah, why don't you take the weekend, and we'll, and, and we'll talk again on Monday. And on Monday, Kathy Bell called back again and said, I'm in. And how did that happen? I didn't ask Kathy Bell to do anything. I didn't have a plan, a four-point plan that said, and Kathy Bell needs to lead it, otherwise we can't do it. I just said, I believe this is what God wants us to do. Hey, would you all pray about this? And she did, and here we are. That's the plan. That everyone who has ears would hear what the Spirit is saying to them. And here's the finish of this message. If you are ready to let the Spirit speak Christ's purposes, your King's purposes for you, then you are ready to affirm vision key number one. You're there. You don't need to know anything else because what Jesus has for you is known to Him. And what comes next will be from Him. Let's pray. Father, let the one with ears to hear, hear. And let everyone here have ears to hear you. It's a noisy world. Noisy, busy difficult, painful, sometimes even chaotic world that we're living in where things happen and we don't understand and people say things we don't agree with. People do things. And that's just Monday. 
And there's conflict going on in the world, conflict in our homes, and it's just really noisy. Right now, we still our hearts before you. And we give you a moment to tap on the shoulder, not of the person sitting next to me on my right or my left, but on my shoulder. I give you time. And I'm not just going to do it this morning while I'm at church. I'm going to do it on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. In fact, I'm going I'm to do it for 30 days. I'm going to start today. And every day for 30 days, I'm going to wake up and say, Speak, Lord Jesus, your servant is listening. Whatever you have for me is what I want. Jesus, I'm going to extend that invitation then to everyone here, everyone listening on the live stream, that we would all commit to 30 days of prayer starting now, starting today, and going through the last Sunday of this series, Affirmation Sunday. And my belief is that you will. You will. That for every person willing, every person open, whether right now they are believing, trusting in Jesus, or not, if they're willing to listen to your voice, you will speak. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.